so Brian, do you want to introduce yourself? Who are you? What is your relationship to the language learning community? Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm Brian. Um, I'm 21 and I'm in South Florida. So, you, you know, you can imagine why I want to learn some languages. Um, I'm half Brazilian, half American. My mom is from Rio and my dad is from New York. And I was born in South Florida. And um, I found out Refold uh, online through, through a friend actually online that I met. And he kind of mentored me throughout my whole language learning journey stuff. And he, uh, he introduced me to MIA and Matt's channel and then yoga and, and the whole, the whole uh, run around. So, uh, you know, I guess I, I got into the whole uh, immersion stuff a bit earlier than you know, a lot of people did. Right. So I've known you via Discord uh, for many years now. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we actually we, we met in a Duolingo Discord. Uh, you know, if you can, if you can remember four yeah. or five years ago, however long it's been. Um, but at some point, uh, you became immersion pilled. Yes. Yep. <laughs> um, you got very into Steve Kaufman and Link and, mm -hmm. uh, you are, or you were, I think now you're going for French, but your history is you're sort of a heritage speaker of Brazilian Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Exactly correct. <laughs> so, and what has that? Yeah, go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say, do you want? I could go into detail. But... Sure, go into detail. Tell us what what is it like to be a heritage learner of Portuguese? Because you know, heritage learners really run the 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 gamut, the gamut. There yeah. are heritage speakers who are very, very good, uh, particularly heritage speakers who live in like enclaves, right? If you if you are a heritage speaker of Spanish and you're in South Florida, if you live in Miami, you're probably going to be much better at Spanish than if you're a heritage speaker in the middle of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, so what is it like, you know, what was your level before you started learning Portuguese officially? What is it like been uh, being a heritage speaker? So yeah so when i first started learning portuguese i basically knew nothing <laughs> i knew nothing at all really i knew some words here and there that i hear but for the most part you know i i really didn't know uh much of anything right um so uh, what happened was i i used to always go to like a charter school for most of my life and they didn't have any language classes there right so and what is a charter school for those of us who are from uh you know the middle of nowhere where they don't have charter <laughs> schools it's it's kind of like a mix of like a public like a private school but it gets like it gets like government money and stuff so it's kind of like a mix of public and private and it's a little more restrictive to get in and um you know at the time i was living in a not the best neighborhood so we, we went over there so um, they didn't have any language classes at that school, so I transferred over to a public school in around 8th grade and I started taking Spanish. Um, and I took Spanish from 8th grade to, I don't know, maybe I took like 3 years or 4 years of Spanish or so. And I was, my Spanish was not great. It was okay, but it wasn't great. You know how public, public school Spanish classes go. Um, so I took a few classes in Spanish and then eventually I'm like, why am I learning Spanish? <laughs> and so I was I was confused why I'm learning Spanish. My mom, my mom's Brazilian. I, you know, I have Brazilian roots and my family is in Brazil. So I decided, okay, I'm going to learn Portuguese and having that Spanish there kind of helped me a bit. So I, I guess I got a little bit of a head start, but not much, <laughs> not, not that much. Interesting. You know, I think in all the time that I've known you, you're the main admin for the uh, the Portuguese server in Refold. I did not mm. know your origin story. This is new to me. No? Yeah. <laughs> really? So you, yeah, you essentially were like a little fresh Portuguese learner initially. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit of high school Spanish. And, yep. you know, I think actually you predate me for being, uh, <laughs> I think you coined the term actually, immersion pill. Um, 
uh, you had Link before I did, and you were very much into immersion learning. So what was your journey after you had Spanish, you switched to learning Portuguese? I know that we met initially in a Duolingo server uh, yeah. many years ago. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's been what, five years? Four years? I don't even remember. Years? I was, I was in high school at that time. You were in I'm high school. You were, under, college. you were under 18. You were a minor. Yeah. I remember that I'm like, I'm old and I'm hanging out with 17 year olds <laughs> learning languages. I remember having that sort of like mid, I don't know, like midlife crisis is like my social, social <laughs> circle of language learners are high schoolers. Um, yeah, but it's been a while. So yeah. were you doing Duolingo at the time or what sort of uh, happened? I, so I guess like, I guess you could say like, if I start a, a little further back, um, one reason why I kind of didn't know Portuguese from when I was, you know, a little kid was because I, my mom was speaking to me in both English and Portuguese at the time. And three years into it, I wasn't speaking a word of any, any language. So she took me to the doctor. The doctor said, oh, he's getting confused, stick to one language. And she stuck with English. And, you know, that's how that happened. So, so I think I started originally with Duolingo after, after Spanish, uh, like Spanish in school, I started using Duolingo and I, Duolingo just wasn't cutting it. <laughs> it, it was fun, but it, it wasn't really cutting it. Like I could tell I wasn't making the progress that I wanted to make with Duolingo. So yeah, I, uh, I got crashing pilled or immersion pilled or whatever it is. <laughs> so crashing and pill, that's what it is. <laughs> so you got crashed and pilled and, uh, you know, for a while there, you were very much a Steve Kaufman stan. I still um, am. I still am. <laughs> you know, you do the Zoomer thing of, like, making edits. And uh, you were a heavy Link user at one point. Mm -hmm. um, so when did you switch to doing immersion learning? Um, I think I really made the switch after watching... Matt's videos and I and meeting this one uh, Brazilian guy on the internet on Discord. Actually, I met this Brazilian guy. It might have been a port. I think I met him in a Portuguese Discord server. I met this Brazilian guy and he introduced me to Matt's videos and he introduced me to immersion learning and all this stuff. It was very confusing at first, and I was all I was having all these questions like how how am I going to learn by just like reading and listening to stuff and. He's like, just trust me, trust me, just do it. <laughs> so, so eventually, this one guy basically kind of coached me into into learning like Portuguese and the whole methodology behind all this stuff. And I really went deep into Matt's videos. I went deep into Stephen Krashen's uh, work, um, and I really also like Steve Kaufman. Uh, his YouTube channel at the time was like, it was really good. So I was on. I I was really you know, looking at, looking at all, like, all these, I guess, like, different theories, you could say, of, of language learning, and when I started to see that immersion was, like, easy and fun, and it worked, and then, like, I just didn't look back. I didn't look back at all. <laughs> Interesting. So, <clears throat> being, you know, half Brazilian, um, Obviously, you do have family who speak Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Your mother speaks Portuguese. What are some challenges that you run into as a heritage speaker that, say, I would not run into, given that I, I, I don't have roots and there are different, different, you know, societal expectations of me and things like that? What are some things that you've run into being half Brazilian learning Portuguese? Uh, I guess there's... I guess there's like pros and cons, of course. Um, you know, some some challenges is like it's harder to connect with your heritage in a sense, right? Like in South Florida, there's a lot of Brazilians who do speak, you know, Portuguese from birth, right? So it's kind of harder because you're kind of seen as more of an outsider and stuff like that. Um, but you know, there's also pros to it too, right? I I, I guess I have a, a better you know, better insight into Brazilian culture and the food and, and, you know, all things Brazil and the TV shows, I, you know, it's much easier for me to find content that I might like 
and different, you know, different cultural things. But in terms of challenges, it, it's definitely, it's definitely like the whole fitting in part, right? I still have an accent when I speak. It's very, it's not even, um, it's not even an American accent when I speak. I hear, I hear a lot. I have a French accent, um, and like. I think it's like a northeastern Brazilian accent sometimes. So my accent's okay in Portuguese, but it's still, you know, people could kind of feel you out. Um, one thing I remembered was, was I took a trip to Brazil around a year ago. And funny story, I was, I was at this market basically, and this guy called me out because he knew I was a foreigner because of my shoes. He He's like, you can't import these shoes into Brazil. So he's like, I know like, I know like either you, you know you know someone foreign or you're a foreigner and he was right so it's kind of those things where it's like you're what not, shoes you know, were they they were sperry boat shoes you know okay. like uh the sperry's yeah i i own several pairs yeah i um yeah. they're sort of like baby's first pair of leather shoes uh, <laughs> and i think i was around your age when i i, I got my first pair um okay so they don't have sperry's in brazil from what the guy says, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, interesting. Um, wow. So you got called yeah. out based on your appearance. You look for it. Yeah, yeah, the and it's I, the way you carry yourself is for mm -hmm. you're very. It's not that American. like. It's not necessarily that I, like. There's no like one Brazilian look, right? Brazil is similar oh, with the like U.S., multi, right? Yeah, similar in size, and it's also very multi-ethnic. Mm -hmm. You know, Brazil's you very your, similar um, though. Afro, uh, Afro descendants. You've mm -hmm. got uh, the whole Pardo thing going on. You've got uh, German Brazilians, Italian Brazilians, mm -hmm. Portuguese Brazilians, <laughs> uh, indigenous Brazilians. Very multi ethnic yeah. country for sure. Yeah, that I, it's not even like my looks that call me out. It's it's definitely the way I behave and think and and act and stuff that you don't realize that like like for example if you're at a restaurant in brazil they give you a cup of ice and they give you the can of soda and you pour the can of soda into the ice you know into the cup well generally in the u.s if you were to get a can of soda you just get a cold can of soda right <laughs> like you really okay. don't so like there's a lot of stuff that like you know like i wasn't used to and that people could kind of tell that you know they could pick you up on some stuff but uh you eventually learn you eventually learn now i remember talking to you pri like previously that trip to brazil about a year ago was a big deal for you because mm -hmm. um, was it your first time going back or your first time in a long time it was my first time in a long time as like an adult and as an adult, you went back and now obviously have some degree of Portuguese ability. You know, mm -hmm. you're conversational in Portuguese. Um, mm -hmm. So how was that? What was it like, you know, uh, going back to the motherland? <laughs> uh, it was, it was, it was pretty fun. It was pretty fun. Maybe, maybe I'm a bit biased because, like, my family lives in a very influential area right they live in rio like along the beach so it's it's you know it's pretty easy to have fun there um sure but i i went alone and this was the first time i really traveled anywhere alone like that um i went alone and uh, i had a ton of family there and they were very 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 happy that i spoke portuguese because their English was really not up to par. Some of them, some of them speak like really good English, right? Um, but I wouldn't be able to, you know, connect as much as I did if I didn't know that Portuguese. And being in the country and hearing it all around you, and it's kind of like immersion twenty four seven, right? Um, so, like, everyone was pretty grateful and pretty, you know, happy that I learned Portuguese before I went there because. I wouldn't have been able to make as many like you know family connections without that right. were there any words that you picked up while you were there that like just hadn't occurred in your immersion so um you know a, a good example is like uh, the word for shoelace or the word for coffee pot like these words that are like seemingly basic words that everybody mm -hmm. knows that just don't come up too often in immersion um 
Were there any words like that that you learned from just being in a Portuguese speaking environment? Off the top of my head, I probably forgot a lot of them just because I haven't you know, been immersed not been there doing, for that much. Yeah. Yeah. And to preface this to give some extra content, although uh, Brian is our Portuguese admin, he's focused on being a web developer, I believe. So your your focus yep. the past year or two has really been on college coding. computer science, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I've been you know, I've been putting a ton of time into coding, so I really haven't had much time to, you know, do immersion based stuff. But um on my free time now, I'm really trying to get more into it. But, you know, during Brazil or during during my trip to Brazil, um, I definitely did learn some words. I really don't remember them off the top of my head. And I'm sure if I, you know, go back there, I would be able to either pick it up or remember the word. But there, there definitely was words that I just didn't know because you kind of had to to pick it up in a sense, right? If, if I was staying with my grandmother, so, if she wanted something or asked me a question and I didn't know the word, I had to learn the word. Or if I was in the grocery store, or whatever it is, I kind of had to learn, you know, these different words. And another thing that that I really didn't like think about was also there's a lot of words that that they're like right, but because language changes throughout the years, it it, it might not be like politically you know, correct to say that word, right? Like we say, one example is like favela, right? We say favela in, in English and, and mm -hmm. um, you know, originated in Brazil. Um, but in Brazil, that's not a politically correct term. Com they, they say like community is, is now the, the term that you're supposed to say. And if I wasn't there, I wouldn't have known that, right? But, but there's some stuff like that where language changes and you don't really you might not notice it and until you're there and then you're like oh okay this is how to how to say this and that like tons of there's a lot of stuff that that you learn and you pick up that maybe you shouldn't say <laughs> but you don't understand you know you don't realize that you might not you know you might not want to say that so you had some out of date or non pc terms yeah yeah gotcha but, yeah <laughs> um yeah i think i've seen that uh there's the um i think the the pc term for predominantly african brazilians is now afro descendentes or something um whereas i think previously they used a different term um mm -hmm. i think i think they used uh like a literal translation of the word black which is now mm -hmm. no longer pc in brazilian culture mm -hmm. and that happens yeah yeah, like language language changes and you don't realize that it changes. And there's, you know, some stuff you might read while emerging or emer there's something immersing. called the euphemism treadmill um, where a word is now seen as crass. So they make a new euphemism for it, a new word mm. for it. And then over time, <laughs> that word, <laughs> the new word uh, slowly becomes stigmatized and you have to have another new word. And yeah. I can see that happening in target languages for sure yeah it's it yeah i guess it's like it's a good way though when you're in the country to actually hear it everywhere and use it right and you're kind of forced to use it because nobody nobody knows english really like some people do but you know not very well i have met brazilians with actually really good english so yeah, I don't they, they do yeah uh but Brazil is, I've dabbled in learning Portuguese, I've dabbled in Brazilian stuff. Brazil is very much about Brazil. You know, they import very little media, they import very little music. Um, it, it very much is a self-contained little country, like a mini America. Mm -hmm. I say mini America, it's about the same <laughs> size as America. Um, so, it's sort of interesting. Yeah, and I, I was, was going to say... Uh, my, the guy that I was talking about that I met online, he, he learned Portuguese or learned English through playing video games. Right. And I think that's a very common thing now where people learn, you know, English. Have you ever heard of Tibia? No, I haven't. 
Tibia is it's an old MMO that was really big in Brazil, even up to a few years ago. Really? Um, <laughs> you got a lot of Brazilians who learn uh, English through like uh, MMO RPGs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's it's always like League or or there was the, there's another one I forgot the name. Uh, you know those type of video games. I always hear Brazilians come out speaking like really good English from them. I'm like. Okay, if I met there's something Brazilian, there. <laughs> I met a Brazilian professional league player. His name is Loop. Mm. Um, I taught him English once upon a time. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I can imagine that. Um, very cool. So, interestingly enough, how does your family feel about you learning Portuguese? So, they're obviously, they're happy. Right, they're, they're happy that you're learning, but mm -hmm. I sound more or less like somebody from my part of America, mm -hmm. more or less. Being that you learned via immersion, but not immersion immersion, you learn via sort of like the MIA refold type of immersion, yeah. you might not sound distinctly xyz you may not sound like somebody from your parents hometown mm -hmm. or you know appropriate for your age you may use words that are bookish things like that did you run into anything like that where like you don't sound like they expect you to um surprisingly not that much right not that much i think earlier my accent was also like quite a bit better than it is now just because i haven't practiced much now but um, they, you know, people could easily pick up that, you know, I'm a foreigner, right? But, sure. but it's, it's kind of like, they, they could only really pick it up after I speak too much, right? If, if I'm just, you know, if it's basic, basic, basic talk, like, you know, they won't, they generally, people just generally don't know. Um, but with my family and stuff like that, like, I, I just think they're more grateful that I just kind of, you know, I tried to learn Portuguese and all that stuff. And if I make a mistake, like there's one where um, I called I called one of my family members or I think like I was referring to like age as in like old and I used the wrong word for old. So you know how there's, and I think it's the same thing in Spanish. There's different words for uh, old and like old an object. Old person versus old. Yeah. Person. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so I would use we, like we have that in Filipino. There's uh, a word for old people, and there's a word for old things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like some like for example, I would I would say like like the word like ancient to describe a person. Like oh yeah, this ancient person, <laughs> but it's, you know it's not ancient; it's old. But there's stuff like that that um, you know they kind of knew what I was trying to say. And they just correct me. So I mean, it was. I think everyone in general is pretty, pretty, you know. I guess grateful in a sense. You know what's interesting is that there's a little bit of I, I don't know diglossia with Brazilian Portuguese, uh, comparing the spoken version to the written version. Mm -hmm. And being that you took a reading heavy approach, you did a lot of linking. Um, did you ever feel that you sounded bookish? That you talked like a book? Not really, not really, because I was I I watched a lot of shows too, but I I don't really think I sounded like a book. Um, I because I've read really good huh? shows, by the way. I yeah, really enjoyed yeah. that one show three percent. Yeah, that's one of my favorites on Netflix. It really, yeah, is. it was really really good, like dystopian sci-fi. I'm like, this is actually really good. Yeah, that's my favorite genre. Like I read, you know, The Martian, the the book by, I think, Andy Weir or something like that. Yeah, I read that book in Portuguese. Like, I just used to get dubbed versions of English stuff sometimes and just read that. So I, I used to read a lot of, like, dubbed content, which is pretty good because the translations are pretty spot on. Um, but I really don't think I sounded bookish. I mean, I think just after hearing so much, like, like, spoken language and with podcasts and, and shows and stuff if I ever did sound bookish at one point it would have flattened that out right when I was listening to those shows yeah. 
And what's on the horizon for you? I know that you've been focused sort of on uh, coding and things like that, professional development. But when it comes to language learning, are you going to return? Are you going to liven up the Portuguese server? Are you going to take it to the next level? Are you going to try learning another language? What's going on? Yeah, so I, I, I need to go back into Portuguese. Like that's you know off. I guess you could say it's off the table in terms of like not doing it, because um, you could kind of feel you could kind of feel when you're starting to slip on on your language, you know. So I know how to learn. I know how my brain kind of works, and you know, like I've been using Link or Link Q or I don't even know how they pronounce it. I think Steve Kaufman. Does he say he Link? Calls it Link. I think he calls okay. it Link. Okay, Which I'll say what I call whatever it. whatever Kaufman but, says goes. <laughs> yeah, I think he calls it Link, and I think. Um, I think Link is official. I think I, t I talked to Steve Kaufman's son on the podcast. Um, I interviewed Mark. And I'm pretty sure he called it Link as well. Okay, so I'll use Link then. Uh, it's but... all these language learning apps and websites have weird names that you're not sure how to pronounce. Like, is it I talk I? Is it I talk? Yeah. Is it E talky? No one knows, right? There's the one. Is it Link? What is, is it? Busu? 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 I, I always say Busu. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> Anyways. But, back, on, yeah, so, back on topic. So, yeah, I kind of I kind of learn how my brain likes to learn languages. So, I know that if I read a certain amount, a percentage of that I'll remember. And then the next day, I review a percentage of that I remember. So, I kind of know how I learn and how I could learn future languages. But I could kind of tell my Portuguese is slipping, so I have to get back into that. Um, and I recently got more into French, um, and I've been using Link a lot because <laughs> when I use Link, I just don't do, I don't, you know, read a paragraph. I, I go, you know, crazy with Link. Um, but yeah, I was, I was thinking about doing French because one, my mom also speaks it. And I also want to go over to France eventually. She worked in the and... hospitality industry, right? Mm hmm She worked in hospitality, so she knew English, Spanish, French, Portuguese. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I bet but you yes. got a lot of like uh, a lot of Quebecers going to Florida for for the winter mm -hmm. or something. Mm hmm yep. Very cool. You're on the on the point. <laughs> so French is on the horizon for you then. Are you currently doing French or is it a future plan? I'm current I'm currently reading tons and tons and tons in French and you know I kind of follow the refold methodology when it comes to speaking I I deviate a little tiny bit with with reading and stuff like that and Anki or Anki uh yeah. <laughs> again it's I, another I, one of those things how do we say I think it's supposed to be Anki because it's like Anki. a Japanese word but okay. I've heard Anki as well it's totally fine <laughs> but uh I, I I really don't like Anki because I find it really boring and I kind of have my own like idea from Steve Kaufman and Stephen yeah no Steve Kaufman I have similar names with Stephen Krashen but Stephen uh Krashen. <laughs> but I with with Steve Kaufman I really like bought into the whole reading thing but I kind of like I know refold it has reading in it and it's a big part but i extend that even further right like my input is like 90 percent reading and then it's usually like 10 percent audio just because it's so much easier for me to get into you know get into a lot of words and get into a lot of different stories and all that stuff um i tend to read some a lot people more. are just readers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know um i've not been doing much language learning myself lately um, I've been in a funk, uh, other things have been going on, but in English, I'm a reader. I mm -hmm. do not have Netflix. I <laughs> do not listen. I listen to one podcast um, uh, and pretty much most of my like English native language content is reading. I'm really into reading like web novels mm -hmm. and things like that. 
So I understand. That was actually an issue I have with my Spanish. To this day, <laughs> um, I have no listening comprehension for Spanish because 99% of my Spanish input has been reading. I use Spanish every day for work. I talk to people, I answer support tickets, but mm -hmm. it's via text, right? I'm not on the phone <laughs> with them. And yeah. I, I can understand that. I feel your pain. Some people are just readers. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, I just prefer reading. I guess that's what it is. And I, you know, I'm not paid by link, by the way. But uh, I really like, you know, how when you click on the word, you hear it too with the pronunciation. So, you know, I go crazy. I click, turn click, that click, off. Click. Really? That's the it best part. It drives me crazy. It drives <laughs> me crazy. That's my favorite part of link is when you could click on it and you hear the word too. And then I kind of like... Com has a link clone mm -hmm. and uh i have to also turn it off for them though they have native audio like actual audio for mm -hmm. the uh the word but mm -hmm. and link it's text to speech and you can actually go into your settings and choose right like yeah with spanish i think it defaults to spain but then you can put on a latin american voice if you want mm -hmm. but it drives me crazy it like <laughs> takes me out of the immersion i hate it yeah <laughs> I, I disable it I got I got used to it I guess but uh, yeah I, I just I just have to read it and I and I know that if I read I learn that's that's like that's kind of like my bread and butter if you will you know if I if I read enough I'm gonna learn it and like once I could read a pretty decent amount then I go you know a bit more heavy on the listening and because you know when you first start to listen it's all different from retold. Refold recommends same language subtitles, which is a form mm -hmm. of reading. Mm -hmm. You know, I I go hardcore though. I don't I don't even like subtitles <laughs> because then I read the subtitles. <laughs> exactly. That's why we consider having same language subtitles a type of reading, reading because yeah. you are yeah you are in fact reading. But yeah, so it's you know it's just it's one of those things that I'm like. You know, I, if I, as long as I put in the time, I know I could just, you know, progress in whatever language I really want to. So, um, yeah, I mean, in the future, I'm considering French. I, I literally just started, um, maybe like two or three weeks ago or so, maybe two weeks ago. Okay. Um, Portuguese I've been doing for a while, but it's kind of been like on oh. and off and yeah, like it's been inconsistent. So I really can't give you like a great time period for that really um maybe well, you've been maybe doing portuguese off and on for a long time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's always been that way even when you were um when you were younger <laughs> when you were still in high school i remember you had periods where you would do a lot of reading a lot of linking and then you'd have periods where you lost interest and did other things <laughs> and that's fine success is not always like an, an upwards trajectory right you've got mm -hmm. dips where you do other things mm -hmm. yeah i think reading is kind of also like you know it's kind of like a natural spatial repetition system right the, the most common nice. words yeah the most common words appear most so generally i just consider it kind of like natural natural flashcards or whatever <laughs> so what drew you to french i mean it's not like the biggest departure from portuguese but unlike portuguese where you have familial ties and like a, a connection uh french seems sort of like it came out of left field mm -hmm. it it kind of did <laughs> it kind of did come out of uh nowhere in a sense because um you know with with the internet and with covid i spent a lot a lot of time uh on discord Right. And I think that's how I progressed pretty quickly, too, with a lot of my speaking skills is I was like almost every day, uh, you know, speaking with different people. Right. And it's, you know, it's sometimes kind of fun because, you know, an American joins the call and they're speaking, you know, Portuguese and then you start speaking Portuguese and they're all, oh, my God. <laughs> so so it was, you know, I, I interact with a lot of people online every day and Recently, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's where I am online, <laughs> but I've been, I've been talking to a ton of uh, Canadians, a ton of French people, a ton of people, some Swiss people, but people, people from, you know, from French speaking countries. 
And I already kind of had an interest in French as well, just because I kind of liked the way it sound. Um, I, I have a friend in like in real life um, that they're studying in France in French or in France now. So so it's like I've, it's just recently I've been getting a lot of French around me <laughs> and I was like, oh, it sounds interesting. I like the sound of French. I, you know, I would be OK with, you know, learning more French and getting into French culture and maybe visiting friends and all this other stuff. So I'm like, oh, why not learn French? Um, you know, if if I'm, I'm you know, I'm kind of a little tired of Portuguese because, you know, after spending so long with it, it kind of get, kind of gets a bit boring and like finding new words to learn is sometimes a bit trivial because once you get a bit higher, you, you, you start to like run out of those words that are kind of easy to get. So you run into less, you know, less common words and, you know, it gets a bit more difficult to, to really, you know, progress. So I was like, oh, let me try French. The words are similar enough to Portuguese. Um, and I was like, I, I want to give myself a challenge also. I want to see how fast I could learn it just because they're very similar. And I'm also going to be uh, much more on top of like documenting my my words learn and how many hours of listening I got and all this other stuff because I really want to see like oh it's sort of like a chance to do it right mm-hmm mm -hmm. it's a, it's a kind chance. of from scratch but not you know Portuguese not really but it's kind of from scratch with, with Portuguese you you did bits and bobs in different orders and mm -hmm. you were younger and you didn't track as much and this is sort of a a, a do-over in a sense Mm hmm yeah it's it's one of those things where I, I almost call it like a study of myself right because i i always have these you know different ideas floating so, in my head about how we learn language yeah and what, one thing is um you recently uh were diagnosed with add as well right adhd mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that can change how you go about learning you know mm -hmm. i myself have adhd and adhd pi um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I wonder if sort of the coping skills that you've learned uh, with your diagnosis are going to change how you approach learning French as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's definitely a point because, or a good point, that is. Um, because it's, it's one of those things where you could kind of use it to your advantage in a sense, right? Because, in you know, if you don't, like sometimes I know it's bad, but I really like can't focus on my schoolwork. But for some reason, I could focus on Link, and I could be say on Link for three hours. So, uh, so I guess like in a sense, it's a strength. I like the I gamification guess. on Link. I just it's something about turning blue words into yellow words. I'm the and... biggest Link simp. I'm a simp for Link and Steve Kaufman and Stephen Crash. And I'm a huge like. They, they they grew on me so much. <laughs> but, yeah. But one of the cool things about French is um, it's sort of a, a great gateway drug into Africa. You know? Mm, uh, you're right, yeah. A lot of the biggest French-speaking cities in the world are in Africa. Mm -hmm. And that's something I always loved about Portuguese, was watching Angolan and Mozambican content. You know, because mm -hmm. like in parts of Africa, their internet is, or not their internet, their electricity is prepaid. They prepay mm -hmm. their electricity. And like, um, so I know that you mentioned, you know, Canada and Europe, but there's this whole massive continent yeah. out there of continent. It's so different. When I watch, uh, uh, you know, um, Patria Minha in Portuguese, mm -hmm. uh, he's in Mozambique. I watch him hunting jungle rats for food. That's just very different content that you get out of mm -hmm. Europe or North America. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very interesting content. And mm -hmm. my former brother-in-law is a French speaker from Africa. Yeah, I feel like a lot of a lot a lot of it goes kind of under the radar because I think Europe and the U.S. and Brazil and you know, all these like big, powerful countries kind of take the spotlight, right? If we like, we all have such a huge internet presence that, you know, if you talk to someone online, like 
It seems like half the time they're American, right? There's a digital divide. There's really a digital divide. Some mm -hmm. countries are very, very online, and some mm -hmm. countries are not. Yep, and that's that that that's exactly it, right? It's like you, I, I rarely, really, really, rarely find like like people from Africa online that are you know that are learning a language and that are doing all this stuff just because it's just i don't know if you just don't come into contact even though you can I met... find it if you seek it out though yeah i, I joined uh, a madagascan so madagascar mm -hmm. uh discord server once upon a time and i was hoping to see malagasy the the native language of the island mm -hmm. unfortunately uh most people <laughs> there spoke french yeah uh, it was, so it was a very french dumb but i mean they exist if you seek them out but they're not yeah. in your face right yeah it just reminded me i had a friend uh, that i met on discord and her dad was like an ambassador for like an african country and uh i was like oh my god <laughs> and you know she she speaks french and i'm assuming uh like you know both countries are french speak it's i think it was canada and something else both countries are probably French, you know, French speaking, but um, that just jogged my mind because, yeah, you you can you can find people who, you know, who are from Africa who have these like, you know, different accents and all that stuff and different content. Yeah. For sure. But I mean, there's nothing wrong with like in Canada and France and Belgium. And they get Switzerland. they get. They get too, okay. France gets too much hate. I'm sorry. There's too much French hate oh, yeah, there's online. Nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Follow your heart. Follow your interests. It's just <laughs> I really like the content that comes out of Africa. I I can just watch mm -hmm. it, you know, because it's such a totally different sort of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, watching people literally go to the market and do their day to day life. Um, the contrast is very interesting. Yeah, and you, you get you get used to different words too, right? There's some words that won't really pop up as much in, you know, like Western countries, I guess. Um, then you would see in you know different media, right? Like I know with with like tell you, you know, it's strange what words we know. Like I know mm -hmm. the word for um, for like the uh, for weevil in Filipino. Uh, it's like a little insect that gets on your grains and eats your grains. <laughs> Why do I know that word? Because I have to fight for my life to keep the rice weevils from getting into my rice mm -hmm. and infesting my food. You know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, like, I think I heard the word hateiro, like rat trap, in Portuguese. And I learned it because I was watching somebody in Lusophone, Africa, who was mm -hmm. hunting jungle rats. That's how I learned the word for rat trap. Whereas, you know, something like that might be less common uh, if yeah. you're watching, you know, Brazilian dramas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, you're, you're right. You're right. Because like, there's, it, it just, it's just how common it pops up, really. That's, I guess that's what it ultimately comes up to is what your, you know, the domain, what domain you're watching and how often, you know, the words come up, right? So if you're watching a different domain, you know, in this case from Africa, right? and you know french speaking or portuguese speaking um you 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 learn different words right and different foods and different cultural oh, things yeah, too for sure that that happens in english too if you mm -hmm. watch people with you know from west africa with their fufu they take like their, mm -hmm. um it's like a little i don't know what you call it yeah is it cornstarch sort of, or it's like a starch it's like i think yeah. they also use like cassava Mm -hmm. I think they use a couple yeah, of I know starches, and they, they make like the little thing, they like scoop up like stews with it, they dip it in sauce, <laughs> and like, people tend to conflate language and culture, mm -hmm. when they're actually separate. You know, if we use English as an example, you go to Singapore, it's going to be very different than if you're in the highlands of Scotland, or yep. if you're in South Florida. Uh, even if the language is the same, the culture is going to be a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. And people tend to conflate those. But I look forward to it. You should consider having a blog. You get a, get a sub stack and talk about your French journey. Maybe I should. Maybe I should. Maybe I should. That's that, that's a good idea, actually. Because I could, I could really document. And I feel like it might help a lot of people, too. Because, 
If there I could is somebody document... in the community who collects immersion learner blogs. He collects oh. them and he has like a master list. And huh. I might check that out then. Yeah. To kind of see how people organize and all that stuff. Because if I could contribute some data to to uh you know to the community like then I yeah, everything. I, I have a book like right here that like has all my like link you link, link progression, <laughs> uh, my link progression and my Netflix shows that I'm watching, all this other stuff. I have, I, I'm really like trying to stay pretty, pretty focused on that, right? So much effort. I'm glad that you're able to do that because I would fall <laughs> off hard. Uh, it's one of those things where it's kind of like. I, I tell people, like, people ask, what are your hobbies, right? And the first one I have to say is I like learning languages. And they look at me like I have four heads. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not that crazy of a hobby, but it's, I, I guess like it's, it's a, a pretty common hobby, at least. The, the maybe not in the US. Sphere. Yeah. Maybe it's just the spaces that I'm in mm. where, like, everybody I know likes to learn a language and i'm a linguophile i'm not great at my languages i just <laughs> inherently think they're me yeah. you know yeah i just and think that's that's neat. the best part like there's you could you could be like a dabbler where you go into the different languages there's tons of people who are super into you know the detailed linguistics other people are more into how you learn and wanting to get to native level stuff like there's there's a, such a you know broad range of people in the community and uh it's it's very it's very you know weird to me that not everybody's like you know loves foreign languages and loves yeah, tracking I mean, <laughs> tracking part, stuff. The worst part is when you meet somebody who's a native speaker of a cool language. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, you're a native speaker of Somali. I want to talk to you about Somali. They're like, dude, I don't care. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of like if I ask somebody from Kentucky, you know, like, oh, you got a really cool accent. I want to hear your accent and talk about Kentucky. English, <laughs> and they're like, dude, that's just how I speak. A lot of people yeah. don't care, I guess. A lot of people I'm in circles with like languages, but I've met mm -hmm. natives who I'm like, I wish you were a linguophile because yeah. you know, they speak like a cool language or something. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like we we're we're kind of we're kind of lucky that we're living in, in the language learning gold age could say right where we have so much content so many books so much you know tools and and you know we have everything like right at our fingertips right so it's it feels like such a waste to not take the opportunity to 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 learn a language like that we we have language labs so you know you're a zoom but back in the day you would have to go to a language lab where they have the recordings and the material we have more information than a whole language lab in a college did okay. 30 years ago on our smartphones on our devices so yeah. and i st i study ai that's my minor in, in college and i i always think about like now with ai i wonder how this will change language learning right because everyone says oh it's going to replace the need for languages i personally don't think so I think it'll kind of help us though learn languages better and more efficient. And you know, if if you need to explain why does you know why does this come before this or why does this you know you know, you know what's this form and all this stuff, I think that that's like a good use case, right? Is to kind of like have your own tutor in a sense, right? Because I still I, I don't think AI is gonna <laughs> replace the need for languages anytime soon, but I think it definitely in the future also could could really help language learn sure i know very little about ai and <laughs> the the language models and stuff that's all beyond me i guess that's a zoomer a zoomer thing for right now <laughs> i don't even know i think i interviewed somebody um i interviewed he was dutch who mm -hmm. did work with that he was like a compiling type guy mm -hmm. yeah so yeah i definitely yeah and I think he was close to my age, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, in the, the, I'm not on the calendar anymore, as we say, <laughs> when you're above 30. Um, <laughs> but 
Brian, before we go, what are your parting words of wisdom? What do you want people who are new to their journey, or even if they're a little bit advanced, what do you want them to know? What do you want to share? What's your sage advice? I would say that before you you get into your your language learning journey, you could say, I would definitely read up on Stephen Krashen's theories because I think a lot of refold ide you know ideas kind of have that principle of Stephen Krashen. Um, I would say also read a lot and immerse a lot. Personally, I read a lot, but do what you find fun, right? I think that's the biggest thing is do what you find fun and that you could stick to over the long run, right? So I guess that's that's the best way to say it is just have fun, <laughs> have fun with it because you'll get bored of it really soon if you're, if you're, you know, if you're gonna not have fun, right? <laughs> it's like nails on a chalkboard if you're, if you're forced to learn it. But yeah, have fun. <laughs> Perfect. And Brian, thank you for coming on. Again, uh, great job with the Portuguese community in Refold and thank for you. being a good admin. And I Thank you for you. having me. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I want to thank you for listening to this episode of the Refold podcast. If you're watching the live premiere, you're in luck. Right as it ends, we have an after party over on the Refold Central Discord server. Come join us by using refold.link forward slash join and chat about the episode. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to hear more, you can find older episodes to listen to on YouTube and Spotify. Let us know what you thought about the video by liking and leaving a comment below. Do you have suggestions for upcoming visitors or requests for particular topics? Please feel free to reach out to me on Discord at georgepig hashtag 5413 or via email at clayton at refold.la. Thank you all for watching and or listening, and I'll see you next week. Hey, as you know, there's a lot of language learning advice out there, which can make it kind of overwhelming and difficult to actually get going on your own learning. If you feel like you're struggling to figure out language learning, you're not alone. It's an extremely complicated process with tons of different steps. If you're looking for a step-by-step -step guide to create the perfect language learning routine for you, then you have to check out our new course. We spent thousands of hours designing a simple and straightforward process that you can use to create your own personalized language routine that actually works. We understand that every learner is different and that you have to roll with the punches and adapt. Every day for 30 days, I walk you through everything you need to know to build an effective learning routine, no matter your circumstances. We give you the advice and resources you need to ensure your success, so you don't have to waste time looking for stuff to do and can focus on learning. And if any questions do come up, don't worry. We are always there to answer any questions and clear up confusion. And it's all backed by our 90 day, no questions asked money back guarantee. If for whatever reason, something's not quite working for you, we insist you get every penny back. It's time for you to stop wishing that you could learn a second language. It's time to become the master of your language learning journey. Check out the link below to get instant access and start your journey today.